unless you're writing about medicine or technology, you're writing about things that aren't important usually to people in their everyday life. Um, I'm talking about writing for the general reader, of course. And uh, it's particularly hard if you're writing about physics uh, because you're not allowed to use the natural language of physics, the language of mathematics. And, and above all, it's hard when you talk about quantum mechanics, which is so counterintuitive that it can only properly be described in the language of mathematics. Uh, well, all this is really a plea for your sympathy, <laughs> because today I'm going to talk about precisely about what is weird and counterintuitive about quantum mechanics, how it has been that way from the beginning, how uh, two schools of thought have developed to deal with these strange aspects of quantum mechanics, why I and other theorists, by no means all, don't find these approaches entirely satisfactory and what can be done about it in terms of a possible new theory uh, generalizing quantum mechanics. The strangeness of quantum mechanics goes back to the beginning in a challenge to the clear categories uh, that physicists by 1900 had developed in understanding what the world is made of. It seemed that on one hand there are particles, uh, originally atoms, and then the things inside atoms, electrons and atomic nuclei, and then there are fields pervading space, electric, magnetic, gravitational fields. It had become understood by 1900 that light is a self-sustaining oscillation in electric and magnetic fields, all perfectly clear. But then Einstein, in 1905, in order to understand the light emitted by heated bodies, found it necessary to describe light, a, a wave of light, as a stream of massless particles that later became called photons. And on the other hand, uh, electrons that had always been thought of as particles uh, were discovered by Louis de Broglie and Erwin Schrodinger in the 1920s to have a wave-like character. In order to understand the energy levels of various atoms, it became necessary to think of electrons not as little Newtonian planets in orbit around the atomic nucleus, but instead as waves fitting around the atomic nucleus the way waves fit around an or in fit into an organ pipe. And with the various states, stable states of definite energy of an atom being defined in terms of the ways that the electron wave can fit around the atom in the same way that the various tones that can be produced by an organ pipe are defined by the way that the sound waves can fit into the pipe. Even worse, the electron waves, it turned out, are not waves of electronic matter in the way that ocean waves, for instance, are waves of water. Max Born realized that from calculations that when an electron wave hits an atom, it spreads out in all directions, like a, uh, an ocean wave striking a reef and producing waves that go out. Um, but the electron does not break up. The electron goes in one direction or another direction, but it's still an electron. The waves are waves of probability. The electron can go in any direction, 
but it's more likely to go in the direction where the wave is most intense. They're not waves of electronic matter, but waves of probability. All very strange. Physicists had become used to talking about probability, but probability had always seemed to reflect an imperfect knowledge. Nature, as described uh, by Newton, was perfectly deterministic. If you knew the position and the speed of every body in the solar system, you could calculate where they would all be at any future time. Probability came into the picture only when you had imperfect knowledge, as when a pair of dice is thrown and you don't know precisely how the dice are thrown. So you don't know precisely how they'll wind up on the floor. But probability had never appeared as part of the fundamental laws of nature. And as a result, some very distinguished scientists were so appalled that they rejected quantum mechanics. In a 1926 letter to Born, to Max Born, soon after Born had established the probabilistic nature of the electron waves, Einstein wrote, quantum mechanics is very impressive, but an inner voice tells me that it is not yet the real thing. The theory produces a good deal but hardly brings us closer to the secret of the old one. And the old one was capitalized. I am at all events convinced that he does not play dice. And as late as 1964, in his messenger lectures at Cornell, Richard Feynman said, I think I can safely say that no one understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> The break with the past was so great that all earlier theories preceding quantum mechanics became known to physicists as classical. Now, for most purposes, the weirdness of quantum mechanics didn't matter. Uh, physicists learned how to make increasingly precise, successful calculations. Larry Krauss has referred to one of the calculations, well, a calculation of one of the small effects in the hydrogen atom as the best, most accurate prediction on all of science, which is no, gen no um, exaggeration. Quantum mechanics became the basis of our understanding not only of atoms, but also of atomic nuclei, electrical conduction, magnetism, uh, electromagnetic radiation, which goes back to the beginnings, semiconductors, superconductors, white dwarf stars, neutron stars, nuclear forces, and elementary particles. And even the most adventurous, speculative ideas in physics today, such as string theory, are firmly based on good old quantum mechanics, the quantum mechanics that was put in essentially its final form almost 100 years ago in the 1920s. So some physicists, including myself at first, began to think that the objections of Einstein and Schrodinger had been overblown. Newton's theory also had seemed unpalatable to his contemporaries. In Newton's theory, you have a force of gravity acting at a distance that can't be related to any kind of tangible pulling and, or pushing. It seemed like the intrusion of an occult element into science, and it was rejected for that reason by the followers of Descartes. It also was a, um, the force of gravitation was something that couldn't be deduced from fundamental philosophical considerations. 
And it was rejected for that, in part for that reason by the followers of Leibniz. Uh, it was also disappointing because some of the aims of previous thinkers about the planets uh, were now renounced, given up. Uh, both Ptolemy in his book Planetary Hypotheses and Johannes Kepler as a young man had thought that they could deduce from first principles the sizes of the orbits of the planets. Not just given their size, how they would move, but how big are they? But in Newton's theory, that's just something you have to take from observation. Very disappointing. And yet, as time passed, Newton's theory went from success to success, and the successes were overwhelming. Uh, he succeeded in explaining the motions of planets and apples and moons and comets. Even the shape of the Earth and the precession of the Earth's axis were all explained by Newton's theory. Uh, not all by him, some by his followers in the 18th century. Especially in France, which had been a hotbed of opposition to Newtonianism. By the end of the 18th century, it was perfectly clear to everyone that Newton's theory was correct, or at least a spectacularly successful approximation. And we can take the lesson that it's not really a good idea to hold new physical theories too strictly up to some pre-existing philosophical standard. We have to go with it and see where it takes us and see whether or not perhaps we have to change our philosophical standards. And after all, what is so bad about quantum mechanics? Uh, it's true, instead of describing nature in terms of the positions of particles and the values of fields, you describe it in terms of something called a wave function. A wave function is simply, well, it's essentially a list of numbers, one number for every uh, possible configuration of the system in question. If the system is a single particle, then there's one number for every possible position that the particle can occupy. In a way, a little bit like the description of a sound wave in classical physics, but with the big exception that for a sound wave, you describe, you give a number for every position in space that the sound wave might be permeating, but the number tells you the pressure of the air at that point. In quantum mechanics, the number in the wave function at a given position is, well, it's a number that gives you the probability that the particle is there. These numbers, by the way, are complex numbers, but I don't need to get into that. Uh, what's so bad about that? It was certainly a tragic mistake, personal mistake, for Einstein and Schrodinger in their later lives to turn their backs on quantum mechanics and in that way to cut themselves off from the great progress that was being made then by others. Well, now I'm not so sure. Having taught quantum mechanics and written a book about it recently, a, a technical treatise, um, I find that I am not as um, happy about quantum mechanics as I used to be, not as dismissive of the critics. And it's a bad sign in particular that those physicists who are happy about quantum mechanics, who see nothing wrong with it, don't agree with each other about what it means. And I'll be talking about that. Uh, and the problem has specifically to do with the act of measurement. And I can illustrate it by considering a very simple, although perhaps not the most familiar example, the measurement of a spin say, the spin of an electron. Uh, spin is a measure. Uh, it also is called angular momentum. It's a measure of how fast something is moving around a given axis and 
how much matter there is and how far extended it is. It's a number that summarizes all those things. And we talk about the spin around an axis. Uh, and we can measure, the, we can talk about the spin around any direction we like. Um, ob objects aren't necessarily rotating rigidly around one axis. Uh, all theory agrees and experiment confirms that when you measure the spin of an electron, there are only two possible results you can get. Um, one result is a positive number. It's a fundamental constant of nature called Planck's constant that Planck introduced into his theory of heat radiation in 1900. It's denoted with a little h, divided by 4 pi. The other possibility is just it's negative, minus h over 4 pi. Those are the only two results you can get. Uh, these correspond to the electrons spinning mostly clockwise or counterclockwise around the direction you've chosen. But it's only when you measure the spin that these are the only two possibilities. An electron whose spin has not been measured is a superposition of the two states, positive spin and negative spin. A little bit like a chord in music, which is a superposition of two notes and qualitatively different from either note. Measurement somehow shifts the intensity of one note entirely to the other, so you only hear that one note in this musical analogy. Measurement puts the electron into a state where it definitely has a positive or a negative spin around the particular direction that you have chosen to measure its spin. You measure the spin by exposing the electron to a magnetic field, and the direction around which spin you're measuring is the direction of the magnetic field. Now, the, this can be put in terms of wave functions. The, there's not much that's wave-like about the wave function for the spin of the electron. If you neglect everything but spin, then it's just a pair of numbers, one number for positive spin, the other number for negative spin. And uh, you can say that a, uh, an electron whose spin has not been measured, the spin has a wave function that has a definite value for each possible result, positive or negative. So it's a pair of numbers. And there is a rule in quantum mechanics called the Born rule, named after Max Born, that tells you if you measure the spin around some direction, how to use these numbers to calculate the probabilities. It, the probabilities are just the squares of those numbers. The probability of getting a positive spin is the square of that number in the wave function, and likewise for negative spin. Well. What's so bad about that? Uh, well, the problem is not that probabilities intrude into quantum mechanics. We can live with that. The problem is that the way that the wave function changes with time is governed by an equation called the Schrodinger equation, or the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, that does not involve probabilities. It is just as deterministic as Newton's equations of motion. If uh, the electron is described, if the wave function of the electron and its development in time is described by the Schrodinger equation, and also the apparatus of the physicist, and the physicist himself or herself is described by the Schrodinger equation, how in the world do probabilities get into quantum mechanics if all of the laws are deterministic? This is the problem of quantum mechanics. There's a common answer that goes by the name of decoherence. The electron, when its spin is measured, is put into interaction, or any measurement puts the system you're measuring into interaction with an external environment which is subject to continual fluctuations. And these fluctuations 
somehow are, are, are not, well, they're not understood in detail, just as, for example, if you look at something, you're exposing it to a beam of photons that are as unpredictable in practice, if not in principle, they're as unpredictable in practice as a stream of raindrops in a rain shower. And so measurement intrudes probability into physics. And somehow or other, for example, in the case of an electron spin, it's like noise in the concert hall that somehow allows you only to hear one note, the note corresponding to positive spin or the note corresponding to negative spin which it is being somewhat unpredictable. Uh, this begs the question, because after all, as I said, it's not only the electron that's governed by quantum mechanics, and hence the Schrodinger equation, but also the apparatus and the physicist, and they all are governed by completely deterministic principles so if you imagine them in isolation in apart from external environment, how do probabilities get into that picture? Uh, there was an answer to that given by Niels Bohr in what is called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that is that quantum mechanics does not describe measurement. It does not describe macroscopic things like physical apparatus and physicists. It only describes small things like atoms. And uh, nature on the, in the large is inherently unpredictable. And if you expose an atom to an apparatus, you're introducing probabilities. I think most physicists today, perhaps all physicists today, find this unacceptable because we have no idea how to draw a boundary between the realm in which quantum mechanics applies and the realm in which it doesn't apply. And we very much doubt that there could be such a boundary. As it happens, I was a graduate student at Niels Bohr's Institute in Copenhagen. Uh, but when I was there, he was a very great man and I was a very little one. And I didn't have a chance to ask him about this. Today, there are two schools uh, of, uh, there are two approaches to quantum mechanics that attempt to deal with this problem. And uh, they are called the instrumentalist and the realist approach. And for reasons I'll describe, I don't find either of them satisfactory. The instrumentalist approach, uh, regards the wave function not as part of reality, but as simply an instrument for predicting probabilities. Uh, probability is particles and fields. The wave function is just an instrument for telling you about them. Uh, I think this um, is unpalatable for a number of reasons. One is that it gives up on an ancient aim of science of saying what's really going on out there. If it isn't the wave function, what is it? Um, but there's a, there's a deeper reason. I mean, after all, Newton had to give up some of the, what had been the aims of science. But there's a deeper reason for being unhappy with the instrumentalist approach, and that is that in this approach, the laws that tell you how to calculate probabilities from the wave function like the Born rule that I mentioned at the beginning, have to be taken as fundamental laws of nature. You get the probability by squaring that part of the wave function, for instance. But these laws necessarily refer to people. They're only telling you what happens when people make measurements. And so people are getting into the laws of nature at a very fundamental level. It seems to me this gives up on a view of science that first became possible after Darwin. That is that 
we can try to understand humans and their relation to nature deductively from fundamental impersonal principles that we don't want to refer specifically to humans because that would be assuming the answer from the beginning. You can't understand something just by assuming it. Uh, Eugene Wigner has, on the other hand, accepted this view of quantum mechanics. He said, it was not possible to formulate the laws of quantum mechanics without reference to the consciousness. Well, if you're going to refer to the consciousness and the laws of nature, it seems to me you give up on the goal of explaining the consciousness from the laws of nature. Some of the very distinguished physicists who follow the instrumentalist approach would argue that these probabilities don't refer specifically or necessarily what happens when humans make measurements. Uh, they're probabilities for things being the way they are out there, um, whether people are making measurements or not. And I don't find that point of view tenable at all, because it seems to me these probabilities exist only when people decide what they're going to measure. You can't talk, you, you can talk about what is the probability given the wave function of finding a particle has a definite position or the probability of finding that it has a definite momentum, but you can't talk about the probability that it has a definite position and it has a definite momentum because they're incompatible. No state exists in which a particle has both a definite position and a definite momentum, as we learned from Heisenberg. Uh, and similarly, with regard to spin, we can talk about the probability of finding that an electron has a positive spin when we measure the spin around the north axis, the north direction, or when we measure the spin around the east direction, but we can't talk about the probability that the electron has a definite positive, say, spin around the north direction and definite, say, positive around the east direction, because there's no state in which the electron has a definite spin around two, definite, two different directions. It only gets a definite spin around some direction when you measure that. There's a, a, the second approach to quantum mechanics, uh, which avoids this, ops, this uh, objection to quantum mechanics, I call the re realist approach. Not realist in the modern sense of being hard-boiled and without illusions, but realist in the more medieval sense of believing in the reality of something, and in this case, believing in the reality of the wave function. Uh, the wave function is taken seriously as a description of nature, as part of nature, if you like. And um, the evolution, the change with time of the wave function is governed by the deterministic Schrodinger equation, and there's nothing else there. Now, how then does the realist look at measurement? Well, the realist would say, if I measure the spin and find it positive, then the wave function not only of the, well, let me back up. Suppose I measure the spin of an electron around some direction. The wave function, which was pre presumed previously a superposition of terms in which the spin is positive or the spin is negative, becomes a super, it's still a wave function, a pure wave function, no probabilities. But it's a wave function which is now a superposition of two possibilities. One is the spin is positive, the observer found it positive, and he's published it in the physical review, and everyone thinks it's positive. And the other term in the wave function the spin is negative, and everyone in the world thinks it's negative. And so, although you still have a superposition of two terms, the history 
of the world has split, in effect, into two streams that know nothing about each other. Because if everyone thinks the spin is positive, they don't know that there's another stream in which everyone thinks it's negative. This multi-history approach to quantum mechanics was first worked out in 1957 in the Princeton PhD thesis of the late Hugh Everett. And um, it has had all kinds of effects. For instance, it generated some interesting science fiction, including the Golden Compass, and um, also has given possible support to ideas of a multiverse, in which if you ask the question, why are things the way they are, part of the answer is, if you were in a different part of the, if you were in a different history of the universe, a different stream of history, um, things might not be as comfortable as they are, and you might not have evolved to the point of asking the question. Um, I find it not entirely satisfactory either. For one thing, it isn't just that the history of the universe splits into two streams when someone measures a spin. It's continually splitting uh, into a countless, incredible number of streams. Uh, I find that hard to stomach. That may be just me, but there's an, and I, but I would prefer one history. There's another possibility, excuse me, there's another difficulty, and that is um, it's not clear where the rules of probability, like the Born rule, come from in this scheme. I can still talk about probabilities, even though the, way, the evolution of the wave function of the universe is entirely deterministic. I can, for example, get a thousand electrons and, met, and have them all have the same wave function and measure the spin of the electron for each one of the thousand electrons. Then for that wave function, I would say the probability that the spin is positive is the number of times I get a positive spin out of these thousand electrons divided by a thousand, and likewise for negative spin. In other words, I can still make measurements which raise the issue of probability, but I don't know how in the Everett scheme to, to justify the Born rule to show that that's the rule that will give you the right probabilities. Of course, you can just assume it's true as part of the laws of nature, but then you're back with all the problems of the instrumentalist approach, putting human beings back into the laws of nature as if there had been no Darwin. Another problem with thinking of the wave function as part of reality is entanglement. Uh, we naturally tend to think of reality in terms of locality. That is, I can say what's going on in my laboratory, you can say what's going on in your laboratory. We don't have to talk about them both at the same time. Um, but in quantum mechanics, it's possible for a pair of electrons uh, in a state with total spin zero so that the wave function has two terms, uh, one where electron A is up, is spin positive, the other is, that is negative, and then the other term of the wave function, electron A has negative spin, electron B has positive spin. And so you can't talk about either electron separately. You can only describe the state of the system by describing both electrons at the same time. And yet this situation can continue when these electrons move to an arbitrary distance. This is called entanglement. The two, the two electrons are permanently entangled even though they may have no obvious physical connection. Uh, and uh, that was one of the things, in, especially in a 1935 paper with Podolsky and Rosen, that a appalled Einstein about quantum mechanics, maybe even more than the appearance of probabilities. 
Uh, and yet it's true. These entangled states are producible in the laboratory, and they work the way quantum mechanics says they should work. And it's hard to swallow that something that can be so completely non-local could be real. So what should we do about this? Well, quantum mechanics works very well. There's no argument about how to use it, how to do calculations. We all do them the same way, and the calculations work. So maybe it's all just a matter of words. Maybe the issue is not what's going on with quantum mechanics, but just what words we should apply to it, as a school of modern philosophy feels that most philosophical problems are just problems of what words you use. Uh, this point of view is encapsulated in classic advice given, not classical, but classic advice given to graduate students who complain about quantum mechanics. Shut up and calculate. <laughs> On the other hand, the problems with quantum mechanics may be pointing us to a new direction. They may be pointing us toward trying to generalize quantum mechanics. Uh, it may be, for example, that quantum mechanics certainly is a very, very good approximation for small things like atoms. And for large things, it's hard to tell because when you get out into the macroscopic world, you're always involved with the environment. There's always a noise coming in the window. Uh, but if you could somehow isolate uh, a classical, excuse me, a macroscopic system, you would find that it didn't obey the laws of quantum mechanics, that in fact, when you made a measurement, even though there was no external environment, just you and the electron, that the wave function of the electron really did collapse to positive or negative spin. Maybe all the multiple histories of Everett really collapsed to a single history, and we don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't get any, so the idea is to try to construct such a theory in which the Born rule is derivable as a consequence of fundamental principles which are inherently probabilistic. Or perhaps it's part of those principles. But the laws of nature are inherently probabilistic. We just don't get to see that in atoms. And it's hard to see it with macroscopic systems because they're always mixed up with uh, what's coming in the window. But it's true, and that's why at bottom you find probabilities. Now, it's hard to construct a theory like that. Uh, we don't get any help from experiment because all experiments agree with uh, quantum mechanics. But perhaps surprisingly, we do get some help from general principles. There are general principles about probabilities and how they can evolve that are remarkably limiting in the kind of theories we can imagine. Uh, all, obviously, probabilities have to be positive numbers. They have to always add up to 100%. And there is also the requirement that in that kind of entangled system that I mentioned before, whatever you do at one end of the entanglement can't send a signal instantaneously violating special relativity uh, to the other part of the entangled system. That's difficult to satisfy. And when you try to satisfy all these conditions, you find that the time dependence of probabilities is necessarily described by an equation called the Lindblad equation. It was originated for dealing with the effect of the environment, but in fact, it, these conditions are sufficiently restrictive so that when you generalize quantum mechanics, you again encounter the Lindblad equation. The Lindblad equation you can regard as the generalization of the Schrodinger equation of ordinary quantum mechanics, but it contains new elements. 
which are presumably very small, because quantum mechanics works so well, but which represent a real fundamental departure from quantum mechanics. Uh, this is hardly known outside the community of theoretical physicists, but there is, in fact, an interesting school of physics articles that attempt to construct new generalizations of quantum mechanics based on the Lindblad equation. These go back to a 1986 paper, 30 years, uh, to, by Girardi, Ramini, and Weber, working at the University of Trieste. And the physics literature has lots and lots of papers trying to construct such theories, all going back to Girardi, Ramini, and Weber. Lately, in my own work, I have been not trying to construct such a theory, but trying to see how one could use the very great precision of atomic clocks to set a limit on the new terms in um, the Lindblad equation, if, in fact, it has anything to do with nature. In atomic clocks, uh, the essential element in an atomic, an atomic clock is our atoms that have a natural frequency. Um, the frequency is the difference in energy between two states of the atom divided by Planck's constant. It's a constant of nature, although not a fundamental constant, and it's something that can be re relied on to be the same wherever, you're, wherever you are in the world, whatever the temperature is outside, and hence it serves as a standard for frequency um, uh, like the standard for mass, the platinum iridium cell cylinder held in SEV. And uh, calculations in qu quantum mechanics show that using the methods of atomic clocks, it should be possible to tune an electromagnetic wave optical or microwave to the natural frequency of the atoms in the clock uh, to a very high degree of accuracy. In fact, in one case, to an accuracy of one part in a hundred million billion. And in other words, the frequency of the electromagnetic wave can be, is tuned to equal the frequency, the natural frequency of the atom to that accuracy. And in fact, this is achieved. This has now been verified. On the other hand, if the terms in the Lindblad equation expressed as energies were as large as one part in a hundred million billion of the energy difference of the atoms in the clock, the precision would be completely lost. The clocks would not work the way they do. And so we can conclude from the successful operation of atomic clocks that the, term, the new terms in the Lindblad equation, if expressed as energies, the energies are less than the energy differences between states in these atoms, ytterbium or whatever, uh, by less than one part in a hundred million billion. Is that significant? I don't know. I mean, these theories are not only speculative, they're also vague. Uh, we don't have a precise expectation of what that um, energy should be. It's an by the way, it may seem very small, but it's an enormous energy between, compared to the energy difference between the quantum states of a macroscopic object like a pointer. That's many orders of magnitude even smaller than that. Uh, so it, the, this doesn't rule out the aim of this kind of theory of having effects in the Lindblad equation which would drive macroscopic systems in a non-deterministic way into definite states. But we don't have such a theory, and uh, I, I don't know when we will. Uh, I'm driven on this, not only on what kind of energies we should look for, but more generally on the future of quantum mechanics to echo a line uh, from Twelfth Night, 
Viola says, O time, thou must untangle this, not I. <laughs>